Today we're going to be talking about women in STEM and entrepreneurship opportunities, something that often isn't talked about enough in these conversations when we're often talking about hardship and barriers, which we will be covering, but we also want to talk about the opportunities people don't necessarily realise they have, both as women in STEM, but also as women in the world and in the entrepreneurial sphere, which often isn't made accessible to um, students and young people, they have to figure it out themselves. So here we're talking to three very admirable, both women in STEM and entrepreneurs. Um, if you couldn't make your life harder for yourselves, you've got two difficult titles there. Um, so we're talking to Hanadi Javado, who is a managing partner at Sana Capital and deputy lieutenant of Cambridgeshire. We're talking to Dr. Haibo E, who is an entrepreneur focusing on machine learning and AI and is a former executive at Wave. Um, she is an angel investor and mentors particularly particularly female founders. Um, and we're talking to the amazing Dr. Karina Tyrell, who's a venture capital investor at Sana Capital and advisor to early stage health and technology companies. Um, and that's their, that's their biographies. But our first question, so that you can get to know them a little bit, is who are you guys? <laughs> and how did you get to where you are, including on this stage and in both STEM and entrepreneurship? I'd say we could start with you, Hypo, and we can move around. Happy to. Thank you guys so much for inviting me here. Um, it's a bit strange, actually, to be sitting up here, because when I was a student at Murray Edwards, I think 2004, 2008, thank you, Owen, um, <laughs> I was a Natsuki, and I was like dead set on becoming an academic and seeing that academic path. But something about the opportunity to create impact um, in the real world for my mother to understand was always really appealing to me. And the world of like business and the world of like just startups and companies seemed so alien to me. Um, so I got here in quite a roundabout way. Um, I did a PhD um, and realized that actually research as a pure academic focus like didn't scratch that itch of like seeing something iterate fast and in the hands of a customer or a user. Um, and then I realized actually that my scientific training allowed me a lot of rigor in questioning the world and the world not as it is today, but how I think it should be. And one of the things I love most about science and also entrepreneurial endeavors is that it allows you to imagine what the world could be and what the world actually, you know, beyond, you know, what we know already, like what can we create? And doing that discovery work and doing that kind of inventing work was so appealing. So I went via consulting and then uh, DeepMind, which is an incredible company focusing on AI. Along the way, I did a little bit of a detour into a startup from government to try and bridge um, businesses and schools. And eventually found my way to Wave, which is a startup based in London. Actually, its founder was a Cambridge alum too, a male founder. Um, and saw this incredible journey of how you can raise money, a lot of money, scary amount of money, <laughs> from mostly US investors, um, and pursue something really audacious about how the world could look in the future. Um, and since then, I've left to focus on advising and investing, and also really seeing what we can do to support other women, um, and particularly, I think, young women with this idea of wanting to create something new, and build something new. Um, so yeah, been focusing more on the coaching and the advisory lately. Amazing, thank you so much. Karina? So I think the wonderful thing about entrepreneurship is that you can come to it from any angle. Mm. And I think particularly um, having done medicine here at Murray Edwards College, one of the beauties of being able to do a degree at Cambridge and of course, Mary Edwards College being one of the, or the best college <laughs> for not just medicine, but all subjects, <laughs> is that um, your degree can really take you in any direction because it's not just sort of the subject matter that you learn, but it's a way of thinking. And I think that that really pertains itself um, to entrepreneurship, which is something that's a little bit risky it is it's changing it's not static you have to be ready to adapt um, and that's certainly something that my career has taken me on a very changing uh, journey and so I, I mentioned I started here doing medicine at the college following that I worked as a doctor in the NHS for five years and I started to see some of my colleagues who were developing new digital tools for communication between patients and doctors to increase 
um, sort of the patient flow through a hospital, or I was seeing some of my colleagues that were developing new drugs, and I got so excited by how we could really improve healthcare. And so this is what led me more than into the world of business and finance. And so I had a challenge of moving from medicine into a completely different industry. And uh, to do that, I did, uh, well, I can go into it in more detail a bit later, but undertook lots of extracurricular activities to learn a different skill set and ended up going to Goldman Sachs in London where I worked with the healthcare equity research team. So still really using my medical knowledge, but in a very different field. And from there, moving into the world of venture capital, initially worked with the ex-president of Samsung who was investing in the intersection of health and technology. And so I helped to lead the investment thesis there and um, now as a partner at uh, Sana Capital with Hannity, where we're investing in really innovative and exciting companies. And of course, we both have a passion for supporting female founders as well. And uh, like Haibo, also I advise early stage health and technology companies, helping them to grow and scale. Mm. It's really interesting to hear both of you mention the challenges, but also the real strengths that having a background in science and technology and medicine brings to what you've done in entrepreneurship in terms of that, that overlapping but quite still distinct skill set. I think we should definitely talk a little bit more about that. That's really interesting. Um, Hannah, do, would you like to give us your... Well, would you like to introduce yourself, Ruby, before I do? Because we... <laughs> oh, I have so little to say. Oh, oh, the come on, come on, I haven't done a job yet. I haven't no. done any of this. Um, uh, thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. Um, I am Ruby Klein. I'm a Murray Edwards student, third year. Um, I take sociology and anthropology, so secretly I'm not even a woman in STEM. Um, <laughs> but I've done a lot of work with the college. Um, I was JCR president, student union president of the college last year, and have worked really closely with the college in a lot of the development we've done over the past year into um, these conferences and bringing in new opportunities for young women here. I'm really passionate about it, and therefore I keep getting involved, even though I'm technically not meant to. Uh, and so here I am, sat here today. Um, I have worked in student and in national paper journalism, so I do a lot of work in inquiry, um, and that's what brings me here today. I also run my own social enterprise um, on social media about education activism for young people and media literacy. Um, but I mean, it's all, <laughs> it's all in the works, so I don't mean to act as if I have some complete um, background that I can talk about like you guys can, <laughs> but please. So um, I want to say that Ruby is an amazing chair. We had a prep for this. I'm very disruptive. She kept on coming, me, bringing me back to the <laughs> fold and, and very patient and uh, incredibly articulate. So thank you very much for chairing us, Ruby. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, I'm the disruptor. Um, and I talk too much, so I apologize in advance. Um, my, um, um, I'm an imposter as well. I, I've been an imposter all my life, but I'm definitely an imposter here because I'm not a woman in STEM. Yes, I'm a rat. I'm an arts and humanities <laughs> brat. Um, so talking to the six formers in the room, um, when I was about to get into sixth form, um, I was um, able to choose either STEM subjects, pure STEM subjects, or go into the more arts and humanities. I had the grades to do both and, um, or either, um, and actually everybody advised me to go into STEM. So there is something that goes into my life, which is I never listen. <laughs> uh, so um, it's advising my own children now, I probably give them the same advice I was given and they ignore me. Um, well, some of them, well, they all ignore me. I mean, that's what children do, right? But um, talking to the six formers, it was a really um, crucial point for me and I do not regret my choice. I decided to go to where I was naturally good and I was naturally gifted for the arts and humanities. And the grades I got in STEM was because I worked really hard, uh, incredibly hard, but the enjoyment I was getting from languages, from culture, from literature, from history, that enjoyment, that natural. So I decided to be, um, to stop working so hard to just be good and work just as hard to be irresistible as the stuff that I really liked. So that's, I'm an arts and humanities brat, I embrace it. 
But I was in France, and um, in France, if you decide to go down that route, you are actually completely out of the STEM subjects. And you can't work with STEM companies, you can't do anything um, that is STEM related. And you're branded as a failure. Um, do not let anyone brand you anything. So I went on to work into various sectors, um, education, retail, being an entrepreneur. Um, I should say, I've got some degrees, you know, I didn't just make it up like that. Mm -hmm. I went on and I've got a degree in law, a degree, degree in international relation, degree in international business. I speak seven languages. And so I'm not, um, you know, I, I, I may not have a degree in STEM, but I have some degrees somewhere from good universities. I don't have a degree in anything. I'm okay, <laughs> <laughs> then it, just trying to justify being here because you were justifying. <laughs> so coming to the UK, um, I um, discovered that actually on top of the seven languages that I speak equally badly, as you can hear, I'm not a native, uh, um, I'm native in nothing. Uh, so I realized that my special power was to speak fluent nerd. So earlier somebody said that uh, it was all about the geeks. Um, well, I discovered that I like geeks. Um, I understand fluent geek. <laughs> and I can translate geek into English, French, Arabic, whatever language you want, and get people to work together. And that was my special power. And I love Cambridge because of the collegiate approach. You go to dinner at college and you're sitting next to an astrophysicist uh, but, or somebody who's a professor in Russian literature. And you bridge that and you get that information from everywhere. And you see that actually there are so many bridges. So when I, when I was a student here as a postgraduate, I actually discovered that sitting at college, I was sitting next to people who were developing amazing science, amazing technology, but had absolutely no idea how to fund their research, how to commercialize their research, how to build teams. And that's where I came in and that was my special power. Um, Cambridge is also um, a place where you meet amazing people. Um, and I was lucky enough to meet um, an angel investor called Jack Lang, who took me under his wing. And thanks to him, I learned all the ropes of angel investment and stopped working in very traditional fields to go into the tech business, not being a woman in STEM. And uh, fast forwarding, um, came back to the university to set up the first deep tech accelerator in the UK, um, still running at the university, it's called Accelerate Cambridge, provides amazing support for early stage uh, entrepreneurs and set up the entrepreneurship center at the Judge Business School. I have worked with 180 deep tech startups at the university, um, I've helped raise just under I don't know, the number is, uh, I don't do maths. Um, she says a venture capitalist, not true, but the number, numbers don't matter. What matters is that um, success is different. It depends on where you are and what you want to do, but success is really, really different from all of the entrepreneurs that I've worked with. Some of them do not care about money raised. They do care only about um, having an impact, about employing people, about curing people. So my um, uh, working with people who find cures for rare diseases is equally rewarding as working with someone who wants to teach one billion people how to code. And you can do this in Cambridge. I'm gonna finish with, um, so my whole life, like a lot you've heard, you know, a career is not linear. Anyone who tells you that um, they had a plan from the moment they were born to where they are today, I'm probably the oldest on this panel, uh, at 51, you know, they lie to you. My whole life has been an MBA, management by accident. You know, um, it's about uh, pivoting, it's about um, doing the stuff you like and uh, wanting to impact. My biggest achievement, is going to pick up uh, my children from school when they were young and would let me pick them up from school. <laughs> um, and uh, having uh, all of the children look at me and say, oh, you're Tabitha's mom. I was like, Tabitha's achieved nothing. She's five years old, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, but actually being Tabitha's mom or Thea's mom or Thomas's mom or Tahanyan's mom is the best job title I've ever had. So that's me. Thank you so much. Such admirable stories that we've got here and such varied ones as well. And I think that's a really, really interesting lesson to take from this is the very unconventional routes you can take um, and you will end up in 
these spaces, spaces you haven't expected to end up in. Um, so I want to talk specifically about um, potentially some barriers that you faced in these journeys you've just outlined. Um, so I think, again, we can go around and potentially highlight a few specific barriers that you maybe didn't expect to face in your journey, whether that be in career changes, in transitions. I know, obviously, you've talked about transitioning from being a doctor to going into capital, and I think that's a really interesting transition that presumably came with a lot of challenges and unexpected surprises. Um, but I'd like to talk to each of you about what those twists and turns looked like and felt like, and also potentially whether that had any relationship with you coming into these spaces as a woman in a male-dominated field, um, and whether you felt that as a barrier, um, or whether you took it as a strategy, how you interacted with that problem. Um, so again, we can go around this way, if you so wish. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I wish I'd done more um, was to fail fast. And so tech and entrepreneurship teaches you to always be testing things, failing fast. Um, I think if I'd been leaning into that more and test, testing and learning and failing, um, I would have discovered that actually, you know, what really, to Hanadi's point, like what brings me that kind of like irresistible element, that like enjoyment and passion, wasn't electron microscopy. Sorry, Owen. Um, <laughs> and I love it. I love physics. I love the beauty of the natural world. But I was good at it because, of, again, I worked hard. I was adamant that I would try and succeed in this field because I was stubborn, which is also a good quality for entrepreneurial um, work. But what I wish I'd done was to always ask myself, is this the right thing day to day that I should be doing? And actually, one of the biggest challenges that I found was this mental block of, because I'm a woman, I need to be working harder to prove myself. Because I'm a woman in STEM, in a deeply technical field like machine learning, I need to just be trying harder. And everything that I'm feeling that is challenging or uh, like an obstruction is because I'm not working hard enough, or I'm not as good as the men, or it doesn't come as naturally to me because I'm a woman. And it's just for lack of a better word, complete crap. Um, sometimes it's actually because the system itself is designed for men. Like the way in which people reward like performance or success and that definition of success can be quite male oriented. It can be how many papers do you publish if you're in machine learning research? Or what is the like, you know, speed at which you code and ship products? What I've learned over my career, and I think I love all of us as a community to do more of is to redefine what it means to be successful. And I think to have that encompass what women are also really good at, which is bringing people together in teams, working in collaboration, and being able to solve complex problems by looking at it from lots of different angles. Um, I think there's a really wonderful article called uh, The Power of the C Factor in Science, where a researcher looked at what made teams really successful. And it was that glue work, that work of translating, as Hanadi explained, and that you know, view of like business and finance and users and technology and science all together. And yeah, I think it took me a long time to realize that that is a superpower that women in particular are exceptional at, and that we should define success based on how we lift up teams together with that superpower. Um, and also realize if I didn't like it, there was probably a good reason for it. <laughs> so with this philosophy of failing fast, what do you think has been your most successful failure? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I think actually my most successful failure was most recently at Wave. Um, I was part of the leadership team at one of the most ambitious and audacious startups that is currently trying to build something new in the UK. Um, self-driving cars, and I really threw myself into it. I thought, gosh, this is going to be such an incredible challenge because the technology hasn't proved itself yet. The research isn't there, and we're doing research at the same time as creating a commercial product. This is going to be so fun. Um, but the failure that I encountered was actually, to my point earlier, I don't love self-driving cars. I think it's fantastic as a technology and as a research direction. I loved building teams. I loved getting the company to work well together. I loved being still part of machine learning, science, and community. 
Um, but at the end of the day, if this product existed in the world, there are more people excited about it than me. Um, and that failure to recognize that, I think it took me a little while. Um, and part of that, I think, is that narrative of because it's such a challenge, because it's so like, technologically interesting, I should be interested in it. And I'm really inspired by, Hanadi, what you were saying. Like, you follow your passion, and you go to what really gives you that joy. Um, and a lot of the women I mentor, like I often say to them, just because you can do this, is it really what you want to do? And in particular, it cuts in the direction of women who are pushed into more sort of program management or um, like sort of the softer skills elements where what they really want and what they're really good at is being technical. So they want to stay an engineer, but they're told, hey, you're really good at getting engineers to talk to each other. Maybe you should do more of that um, without the recognition that they too are talented engineers. So yeah, I think that's a lesson that I think people in lots of stages of life could learn, but particularly students here, um, you can't mistake being good at something for being something you enjoy, and you can't mistake being told you're good at something for something you enjoy. Um, and in the same way, you can't um, complicate, you can't confuse difficulty and complication with the thing you're doing being the subject that you actually enjoy. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting what you say, that you sort of enjoyed the challenge and the excitement of it, but you were excited about something you didn't care about. So it's sort of, it's a, it's a difficult line to, to cross. Yeah. Although practically speaking, at some point, you also do just need money to support yourself. So there is absolutely no shame in taking <laughs> a role and doing something incredibly useful and getting financial stability. So flip side to that. Mm. <laughs> so Karina, what barriers have you faced? And how do you think that relates to you being a woman in STEM, a woman in entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I mean, the, these barriers or sort of uh, hurdles, and, and I have to say I've used this term before, I do feel like a professional hurdler uh, <laughs> because of all the hurdles that, that I have had to jump over. But, um, you know, I think that provided that you're somebody that, you know, is pushing yourself and driving yourself, and, you know, Hybo definitely has that, and I do think that this is one of the things in entrepreneurship to be successful is having a drive and a passion and you will go for it no matter what um, will enable you to, to sort of overcome some of these hurdles. Um, one of the hurdles I mentioned was, you know, sort of having been educated in medicine and then moving to um, sort of a, a different field and, and going about doing that. And so I really put it on myself to learn about the world of finance. And so when I was here um, doing my second degree at Mary Edwards, I was doing a master in public health. I ended up spending most of my time at the business school and um, ended up joining the wonderful Accelerate program that Hannity mentioned and had uh, sort of my first uh, taste of what it was like to be an entrepreneur and what it was like to start a company. And I think this is one of the beauties in entrepreneurship is that you can start with something very small, just get together with some of your friends or work colleagues and you've got an idea as to how you might want to improve a product in the company that you work in. Or maybe at the time for me, I wanted to develop um, a powdered fruit juice that gave you your five of a five a day in a sachet that you could just walk around with you. So, you know, it was linked to my degree in public health, I guess you could say as well, you know. Um, but having sort of that experience and that company, you know, didn't go on to, to progress or, or lead anywhere, but it was a great experience for me to start doing that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I ended up being part of the Cambridge University Finance and Investment Society. So I started learning from the other students who were doing degrees in finance and economics. I was learning from them about their courses, that's how I learned that Goldman Sachs, which is an investment bank, uh, was doing a program where they were looking specifically for students um, with either a medical degree or a PhD. And so that's what enabled me to make that change into the world of finance without having to go back and doing a third degree, <laughs> which I didn't particularly want to do after all of that. So, you know, these hurdles are about identifying where your strengths are, seeing where your weaknesses are, focusing on those weaknesses, making sure that you can uh, build them out into strengths, and um, you know, having sort of that 
uh, that, that network and a very open mind, keeping your eyes out as to what opportunities are available and then just jumping and going for them. And, it, and you know, this is taking risks. Entrepreneurship is taking risks. It won't always work, but if you never try, mm. you'll never get the reward. So you just have to, you just have to keep pursuing it. And um, you know, that's uh, how, I, how I have sort of overcome some of the challenges and, and the barriers that I've faced. It's really interesting how you describe how your degree that originally had sort of been not a hindrance, but a, something that you saw as very separate from the industry you were going into actually was the opportunity into it. Yeah. I think there's some very, I've, I've received some advice in my life um, that I thought was very valuable that your strengths are often very similar to everyone else's strengths mm -hmm. because you're all working in the same way. But the hurdles you've tried to cross are probably by definition unique. Um, and if you can show how those are the thing that makes you valuable um, to the communities around you, to the jobs you're trying to apply to, etc., you show yourself off as a unique candidate. Everyone is hardworking, but not everyone has overcome what you've overcome. And I think it's a really, really interesting thing there you say about how you can transition. And I think Cambridge is a good place for this as a student. Um, there are so many opportunities to transition what you see as hurdles and difficulties you've experienced into a very valuable and concrete um, pathway into what you want to do. Um, Completely. I and I think that it also um, builds up who you are as a person. So obviously, you're having multiple experiences, you're learning from them, any mistake that you make, you learn from it. And it then means that, you know, when you are putting your CV forward, or you're having an interview, you've got a really varied background, because you've been trying and doing all of these things. Um, and that variability, that difference can, can really make you stand out. Um, of course, one of the things that I did that was a little bit different when I was um, studying um, here at Murray Edwards is um, I ended up representing the United Kingdom at Miss World, you know, and it was being able to have sort of that opportunity to, to be myself, to explore um, different things that really sort of builds up who you are and those experiences that you gain from doing all of these things that might seem a little bit risky, might not always seem to make sense, build you up as a person and really help you to overcome future hurdles in the future. Particularly in, I think, entrepreneurial fields where entrepreneurship, the real strength you have is that you're not like anyone else, so you're not thinking like anyone else. Um, because the whole point of it is that you're coming up with things other people aren't going to come up with. I think it's really interesting there how kind of the odder your combination of experiences are, probably the, the better set you are to come up with something someone else hasn't. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of research into cognitive diversity in existing, established, um, you know, boards. We were talking about this last night at the dinner. Um, there's a lot of research into the strengths you can bring to an existing company by just having had a different experience and therefore having ideas other people won't have. Uh, but no one talks about the fact that that is also how new things start from the bottom up. It's just very difficult to identify that that's where that comes from. Um, I think that's really interesting. Thank you. And Adi, what, what barriers would you say you've faced that have... So I want to start by saying that as an entrepreneur, um, where other people see barriers or obstacles, I see opportunities. So um, barriers, you know, are there to be uh, destroyed. So Natalia yesterday was talking about the struggles she had of sharing a room with her brother, and uh, <laughs> you know, um, and the barrier would have been, um, it would have been very easy for her to go and cry and say, "Mommy, Daddy, you know, he's not letting me play with my Barbies." She came with creative solutions that were formative. Um, whenever there's a wall, um, some people will try to climb it, other people will try to break it, other people will just try to go around it. And some people might just say, oh, it's a wall. <laughs> and the majority of people will just say, it's a wall, and go the other way. So for me, a barrier or an obstacle is something that there's an opportunity. How can I overcome this? Second one is, um, I think that the biggest barrier, the biggest obstacle I've ever encountered is myself, mm. literally. Um, and um, uh, it's not until I was 25 that I realized I was a woman. Until then, um, you know, I grew up um, with three sisters and one brother, 
And my father was incredibly stern on the fact that he was raising four children. So there's nothing that I couldn't do. That, you know, uh, if, and tr trust me, I mean, the man has no hair left. Um, you know, um, anything I wanted to experiment on, horseback riding, rugby playing, swimming. You know, I played rugby with guys. I would come back blue. You know, um, it's you know, try and be, um, I can't, I don't know what the word is in, um, in proper English. I was a hooker in a team of guys where you run, grab the bow. I became a professional scrum enjoyer, you know. Well, my speciality was to uh, grab the ball and run and just hold on to it. And everybody would fall on me. But then that was my technique and it worked. And that's how my team always won. But I was blue all the time. <laughs> so um, it, I do choose the hard way. But nothing was impossible until I came to the UK and I realized I was a woman. I was in a lecture theater very similar to this one. And I was sitting at the back. And um, the director of the program came and said that ladies were no longer allowed to sit at the back because it was a new building. And they had forgotten to put uh, curtsy paneling. And we were a distraction to our male colleagues. I, I'm not that old. That was definitely in the last 25 years here in Cambridge. And I was outraged. And I uh, said that uh, I was really sorry, but Chris, who is American, um, who's six foot four and uh, boxed for Cambridge, had much better legs than me. And he was allowed to sit in his shorts at the top. And he was a distraction for me and everybody else. <laughs> I think Dorothy is starting to regret inviting me on this panel <laughs> or even being a president fellow. But come on, and until then, I never realized that there was a difference. And I, don't, I didn't wear a skirt back then. So it was, and, and then I started getting invited to join boards. And I, I was turning them down, not because I thought I couldn't do it, but because I knew that I was being invited because I was young, I was a woman, and I was from an ethnic minority. And I didn't want to be a tick in the box for all of their diversity criteria. But with hindsight, giving you that advice, if you're offered a board seat or any opportunity, and you think you're being selected on your gender or on your eth take it. <laughs> okay, I want people to mistake me for a token woman. I invite people to want me as a token woman. I mean, you know, I'll give them enough of them. And, and I really regret that. So the biggest hurdle was myself. And the third one, and the last one and final one, is measure of success. So I'm very harsh on myself. Um, and, and that's fine. You're allowed to be harsh on yourself. But do not let other people's measure of success define yours. So for me, I've developed what success means. There are four pillars. One is about learning. One is about fun. One is about societal impact. And one is about money, because we need to pay the bills. And you can't always score high on all four. There's a minimum that I accept. And, when it's, and there are pillars that are more important than others. But do not let anyone impose on you what being successful means. That's Thank you very much. <laughs> so we very sadly are running out of time. This is such an interesting conversation. Um, and I have so many questions left to ask. Um, but I'd like to talk specifically about, we talked a little bit about this in our prepping call, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, is entrepreneurship built for women and the lives that they realistically live? Um, and how have you as women navigated that field, both in terms of your professional lives, the barriers we've already talked about being faced because of your gender, because of your identity, um, but also the, the lifestyles that realistically women often live and they are often the barriers that women have um, to going into these fields. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, but I won't um, you know, target anyone. Does anyone have any initial points they'd like to make in regard to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, um, entrepreneurship today, if you look at the numbers, it is not a comfortable place for women. So in um, 2021, only 1.4% 1 
of the 23 billion of funding that went into UK startups went to UK female founded companies. 90% went to all male led founded companies. And that's a really shocking statistic. And we need to find ways where not only um, are we funding more female founded and led companies, but also um, supporting women who want to start this entrepreneurship journey and start their own businesses and companies. And obviously we've talked about some of the barriers and in, in why that is. This is one of the reasons we have this wonderful enterprising women um, initiative that we're doing at the college because we really want to support women who want to go into entrepreneurship. And it is a hugely rewarding um, job to, to do. But we do need to try and find, um, you know, not only sort of at the grassroots level, but also um, on sort of the policy level and others, how we can try and change some of these numbers. And one of the ways um, that I see is that we also need more female investors. And so all of us here um, are female investors. And I think that that makes a big difference because I have worked in teams where I've been the only woman in an investment team of eight men. And you need to start to change that balance because in female investors are more likely to invest in female founders because we just have a different way of viewing companies, viewing risks, viewing opportunities. Um, so there are definitely changes that, that need to be made and we're not quite there yet. That is a really shocking statistic. And I think it is a very, it, it's a difficult um, balance that you have to be realistic when you're offering people opportunities, um, particularly marginalized groups opportunities about the rooms they're going to walk into. Um, and I think there's a lot of conversations here about this is a fantastic place as young women to grow and develop your ideas in a place where you are not the minority when you walk into a room. Um, but then to walk out of here and to go into these opportunities and to go into these boardrooms and to say yes to these opportunities, ultimately you are still sitting on one of these boards where you are the only person representing a category you are not qualified to represent, you shouldn't be representing, um, and you're coming in with a completely different lens. I think it's, a, it's an interesting difficulty that both the industry is facing, but also the people having to walk into those rooms. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that you brought that up. I think it's really interesting. It's sort of, it, it's the next step, isn't it? Getting to um, almost representation, not for the sake of representation, but representation because you can't put yourself forward as a person with ideas if you are stepping in as a woman first and as the only woman first. There is absolutely nothing you can do if your identity comes before your ideas. Mm -hmm. um, would either of you like to speak on kind of entrepreneurship and how it's built for women? So I'm gonna say something a bit contrary and I might be contradicting my earlier point, um, but I don't think women should walk into that pitch room or that boardroom thinking I'm here because I'm a woman or I am a woman, what does this mean? I think if you look at the world of business and if you look at the world of entrepreneurship in particular, to Hanadi's point earlier, like it is all about rule breakers, people who wanna shape the future differently, who see opportunity and not a wall. And I think that so often women and myself included, I've walked into meeting rooms, I've walked into board meetings and investment committees thinking, oh gosh, I'm a woman instead of, I'm here with a great idea and these people are lucky to hear it. Like, this is going to really change things. And it's that confidence, that view of like, I've got something special to offer and it's not because I'm a woman and I think differently or I you know, have all these shiny badges and Cambridge University. It's because I've overcome a lot of barriers or hardships. I've learned a lot from my failures and I've seen the world in a different way because I've been out there and I've been trying. And it has nothing to do with gender. Any gender can do that. And I think what's really important is we don't limit ourselves by thinking, oh, I'm already you know, one step behind because of my gender. The reality, of course, is that you know, there will still be a lot of men who look at you and see primarily that you're a woman. But the question I often ask my female founders that I coach and mentor is, when you go for investment, what you're bringing on board is a team member. 
This person is going to be your business partner. If this person across the table from you already thinks you're discounted because of your gender, do you really want to be working with them? Like, do you want someone who already thinks that you're going to fail because of something that you can't change about yourself and frankly has no bearing whatsoever on your ability to solve a problem? I really think that you should go into that room and that confidence of you have something to bring, which is your idea, your grit, your determination, your experiences, what you've learned about life in the world. Yeah, I don't think we should be gendering ourselves as a barrier. So, a bit contrary. <laughs> no, I think it's a, really, it's a really good point. And I think it also speaks to how, if you are walking in as any individual, you have to fight what you know other people are thinking about you. And just mm. as we were talking about in terms of being the only woman in the room, everyone else is thinking you're the only woman in the room. So the only way you can fight that is by adjusting that to yourself and acting appropriately. Because if you're thinking it, they're winning. Exactly. So I'm, I'm um, you, you're not going to believe it. I'm very shy. I am <laughs> incredible. No, seriously, please do not laugh. I am really, sh this is, this is harassment. <laughs> I, this is bullying. I am incredibly shy. My favorite place is actually home with my dogs and a good book. Um, I, but it is not where I need to be. I need to be here, I need to be loud, I need to be disruptive. And um, when I walk into a room, my first thing, or when I'm on a Zoom call or anything, is I count the number of women and the number of men. And somebody yesterday said, it's really easy, you know, it's cube of one, double of one, and thing. <laughs> no, and you know what? I call it. I call it, say, oh, am I your gender token today? Am I your diversity token today? Oh. You do work on diversity, don't you? Right? Um, I call it. And um, I, was invite, I was invited by a firm that shall remain nameless because we're on video, uh, engineering <laughs> firm, international listed, to go to The Hague to be on a judging panel. Why? Because they could not find anyone, any, well, anyone, they could find lots of people. They couldn't find women within their organizations to sit on that panel. So they paid for my flight, for my hotel, for my time, because, and I didn't realize that I was invited just for that. But once I got there and I got the message, and the room was um, <coughs> even less diverse than this room, okay? They were, the, the ra come on, this is not a diverse room either. This is, <laughs> this is surreal. Um, I like it, by the way. Um, you know, so they asked me, so hey, Han it was broadcasted to all of their staff, all over the world, 18,000 people. Hey, Hannity, welcome to The Hague. Uh, what did you come here to look for? And I was like, well, if I was coming here for diversity, I'd be disappointed, right? <laughs> uh, and but seriously, you have to call it, right? Call it. Do not let anyone get away with it. Do not let them make you feel uncomfortable. And do not ignore it. Because it's not your problem. It's the world's problem. And you have something to bring. So I never walk into a room thinking, I'm going to be the only woman. I come into the room and I make them aware that I am just as good, if not better. Is Amy still here? There was an amazing student yesterday who said she really loved being um, in supervision with boisterous boys who um, talked about not, uh, everything and anything, and she knew more than them. Well. You know, I love that too. I give them a lot of rope to hang themselves with. <laughs> okay, so I'm the chairman of an infertility company. I'm the only woman on that board. Um, I know a thing or two about um, sperm mobility. Um, I, we're going through FDA, so I have all of the... I was at a dinner party, and this investment banker who studied some degree in ancient Norwegian, at, uh, at Durham University, not even Oxford or Cambridge. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I, am, I am kidding. I am kidding. I'm joking. Okay, I am, it is a real joke. I, but he acted like we talk about entitlement, um, and he was giving a lecture on. Um, fertility and he knew nothing and what he was saying was wrong and there were children I mean young people in the room and I said to him and you're basing all of this on and he looked at me and said well experience I said well I'm sorry facts and experience science and experience I said I 
I'm really worried about, you know, um, but it, it is about calling it, letting them and calling it, do not let it. So um, there is a self-selection and thinking that women are investors are going to be nicer to you because you're a woman is a mistake. Women and some women investors, so I, I, have, I do some angel investment, I do it because I want to have an impact and not looking at the financial return. And I will be investing more in women on that. But as an institutional investor, where I have taken money from um, other investors and promised them a return on investment, I cannot be nicer to you just because of your gender. I'll be equally fair. This, this, the, the wage. And I have heard women investors being harsher on other women because these women are not fitting the mold that they're in. So there are male investors who are much more supportive of female founders than women investors. So let's not separate that. So it's really important. Um, there is a huge opportunity in entrepreneurship. Yesterday, um, there was a professor who said that um, postdocs are a failure factory, that basically people are coming, getting postdoc after postdoc, but actually not getting that position in uh, academia that they're looking for. They are trained, they're incredibly smart, they go on and they have amazing careers, but they didn't get that career in academia. Does it make them a failure? So one in 10 postdocs get that tenure. What happens to the nine others? Well, there's an opportunity in entrepreneurship. There, and I've worked with amazing postdocs that have built amazing companies. So. Amazing, thank you very much. Now we have very little time for questions. I'm so sorry, we just had so much to talk about. Um, but I think we can probably take some fairly rapid questions. <laughs> um, so do we have microphones that are going around? Okay, amazing. Um, so do we have any questions? Uh, Yes, over here. Thank you. This is very interesting. I'm uh, personally an academic, and um, um, I think it was Hanadi that said about take the opportunity. If you are a woman, and they give you a position somewhere, just take it. But it comes back to the workload, because we face similar issues uh, in the academia. You are in more interview panels. You are doing more service. Everything is more on that front of the work because you are a woman. So I'm just wondering about the, the message a bit, uh, how to navigate it and do, them, do ourselves as women, you know, um, the right choices for moving forward. So speaking to that conversation about the relationship between the work you have, the extra work you have to put in, saying yes to these opportunities, but them also functioning essentially as extra labor. Um, would we like to speak on that? So I would just say two very quick things. The first thing you're talking about, the right decision. I think there's the right decision at a certain time in your life. So, uh, and that can change. And the other thing is, um, as a woman, I generally believe you can have it all but you cannot have it all at the same time. So there are um, times in my life where I knew that I was going to take this extra work, but I would have to cut down on other things. Um, and um, so I'm a single mother, I've raised four children all by myself. Um, I can tell you, I know one thing or two about time management, and it's <laughs> really about, the one thing I would never ever cut on is the time allocated to my children. But I have actually made personal sacrifices on time for uh, my reading, the sport, my social life. And it's about what works for you. It's not what works for me or for Ruby. I would also add to that that one of the things that I've learned quite brutally uh, through my entrepreneurship journey is also about quality management. And I think we all know the Harvard study that says a woman won't apply for a, a job unless she takes all 10 of the list of 10 criteria, whereas a man would go, oh yeah, I can do maybe one and a half of these. I'm totally great for this job. Um, this also translates, I found, to women when they look at the output of their work or their role as mothers or their role as like caretakers in their family and community. We have such a high standard for ourselves and it's like backbreaking. 
And taking on multiple projects requires you to kind of let go a bit of your really super high standard for ourselves. And maybe this is going back a bit to my point of we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't think of ourselves as needing to work harder because we're women. Men have gotten away, sorry men, generalizing here, but there have been so many instances in my career where I've seen an engineering lead present a half-baked idea and people are like, oh, that's great. Let's like, you know, roll with that and see where it goes. And that's good enough. Whereas a woman in the same position, I've noticed her doing four hours of research, finding all of the supporting evidence, doing basically half the product already to like demonstrate that this idea is good enough. And that's unnecessary work. That work could have been taken on by the team. So the quality that we demand of ourselves, I think if we want to have diverse portfolio interests and take on some of these opportunities that are presented to us, we have to just be kinder to ourselves about that. I personally will be taking that feedback on for my supervision essay, <laughs> um, <laughs> which will from now on be one and a half out of two, let's say. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? May I just do potentially a follow-on as well? You're not alone. Mm. And, um, and there are people who are invested in your success and in your um, career development. So maybe go and talk to your boss, to your supervisor, and say, there are all of these opportunities, but there's also all of that extra work. How can we make it work? Mm -hmm. And I think um, another thing that I'm not good at is to ask for help. Mm. But something that I've gotten better at is communicating my ambitions and goals and bringing people together behind me. So I think uh, you'll find that a lot of people, men and women, will be incredibly supportive and wanting your success. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think one of the things that you know, we've kind of mentioned before is it takes a whole group, a village, your network and your supporters. I think you mentioned how actually what you found was a lot of people that you learned from and that you could work with. And I think this is a, a superpower that women are also really great at. Like, you know, we hear a lot about the, the boys club and things like this, but women, when we're working for each other and with each other, we can be so supportive. And I think that's so crucial because we can share the load that way. Uh, I think we have a question over here. Not only really a question, but a short comment in support of what Anadi was saying about celebrating being the token one. Um, <laughs> contribute and so on and so forth and how many seats, how many postdocs do they get in return and so on. And she said one of the delegates was actually an American, even though the Americans are not part of the CERN operation, <laughs> so he was not actually a scientist, he was somebody from one of the state, from one of the departments, and he was black. And they walked into this meeting and he walks up to her, holds out his hand and says, hi, I'm the black, you must be the woman. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think there is definitely a power in. Um, there's, there's a lot to think about when you think about who benefits from staying quiet about the fact that you are being tokenized. Um, if you walk into a room and you fail to acknowledge that you are the token one and you've been put there for political reasons, not due to your worth as a person with ideas, um, if you keep quiet about that, you are benefiting the person who put you there for that exact reason uh, and wants to keep you there in that exact role for that exact reason. Um, and I think that's definitely, that really is what's so important about calling out um, when you do find yourself as the tokenized position. But I think it's, it's a difficult medium to cross with what we were talking about as if you want to make the most out of that position, you have to walk in as a person with ideas. But if you want to make clear that you don't intend on staying as the token person, you also need to make clear that you are not going to keep quiet for the sake of those who've put you there. I think it's a very, very difficult medium to cross to. And when you're in that position, you are hopefully able to then change the status quo. And so not only are you potentially starting off as that token individual, 
but you are then building an organization around you so that you are no longer that token individual. It was really inspiring being here and seeing so many amazing women on stage. So I, I've been, I only missed two hours, I think, of this uh, of, um, STEM festival. I'm really grateful to Murray Edwards for putting it together because seeing all and listening and being inspired by all these women who have been the first, second, third, fourth, it, they're opening the door to the next generation. And hopefully in 10 years, 20 years, we won't be counting because there will have been a floodgate. Do not be, I'm, I'm now talking to the women in the room. I know that the men who are here are self-selected and are already allies. You know, I'm, I don't need to preach to you. I'm gonna talk to the women. Do not become that woman who fought so hard to get to where she is that actually she wants to keep it harder for the other women. Mm -hmm. There is um, a gift about women working together, but women can also be very destructive for one another, and I've seen it happen time after time. Um, I cannot remember, I think it's Madeleine Albright who said, there is a special place in hell for women who do not help other women. So I'm preaching to all the women in this room. Do something nice for another woman. Leave this room and go and do something nice for another woman. Just like the boys have their boys club, you know, make the girls club even more powerful by helping other women. I think that that's something that is really important. I think that's also really kind of the heart of what I love about this new wave of feminism. Like we're here to support each other and also to normalize that <laughs> being a woman means that you can be powerful, that you have ideas, that you can make something new and also not be mean to each other and a horrible person. Um, there's a lot of what I found is like toxic masculinity traits that people have mistaken for leadership or being successful. And I feel like, you know, this generation of women and some of the women before us, we have a chance to redefine that. Mm. And I don't want to be a successful toxic masculine man um, disguised as a woman. It's just not, I think, what the future should be. And it's not how we should treat each other and like build our societies and our companies and our universities and institutions. So yeah, it's kind of like on us to redefine that. And I'd entrepreneurship, I think, is a wonderful environment in which that, mm -hmm. in, you know, that sort of fostered um, openness of sort of being who, who you are and mm -hmm. not having to lead in a certain way because entrepreneurship is all about doing things differently. You're not necessarily in a very defined corporate structure. So you can bring your own culture to a business. You can start it and create it yourself. So that's one of the positives about entrepreneurship um, as well as you know, a flexible working pattern. Um, you, you, you define what you want. That is the definition of entrepreneurship. You're creating something new. Create that culture, that network, that female empowerment that is also new as well. Ruby, I, I think we were talking about toxic traits, and um, and I think they can be masculine or feminine. I mean, they're toxic traits, and I have one of them. I man interrupt. <laughs> and I'm an interrupted uh, lady behind Dorothy who had a question and I jumped in. So would you like to ask your question? I, it wasn't quite a question. It was just to say that for me, the most important thing in my career and my life has been my integrity. Mm. When I realized that if I always told the truth, I didn't shy away from it. You can yeah. not tell the truth by not saying anything. So calling out is one thing. Just be frank about everything. You are trusted. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful who you trust, but if you can be really trusted, you will gain whatever you like in entrepreneurship, in anything you do, and you'll be happy. You will have no sleepless nights. <laughs> um, I'd like to end on a very, very quick um, request from all of you just We'd love to get one sentence of advice or a philosophy that you carry forward in your own work that you would give as advice to young women who might want to go into the field you're going into. Um, but please do keep it to one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe we can go around this way this time. So, um, if I had a time machine and I could go back to um, 10 years old me, 
um, who was um, a refugee in um, country was a weird name and people couldn't pronounce it and making fun and who was browner than everybody else and who was very different um, also academically and things. If I could go back uh, and I'm talking to our six formers, I'd say embrace your differences. Mm. I, I said once I wanted to go back and say to this little girl, it's okay to be different. And uh, the male token chair of the panel said no. In mm -hmm. our organization, we don't say it's okay to different, we celebrate differences. <laughs> so no, and, it, and they do. And I would just say, celebrate your difference because this is what's gonna make you special. That's your special power. Thank you. Three short sentences. <laughs> Please, one, be courageous, take risks. You'll learn a lot from them. Two, make sure that the relationships you create, keep in touch with them. They will last and they will support you in your future going forward. And three, the dots only connect in, when you look back. So don't be worried that the path that you're treading is unclear, the dots will connect at some point. I feel like I don't have much to add to that. Um, I would just echo this wonderful point that you made earlier, which is have integrity. When you're making something new, when you're doing research, when you're trying to discover anything, what really matters is that you have that integrity to be honest and be truthful. And that carries through to how you treat people, because your word at the end of the day is gonna be the marker of your success. And who buys into that word, who buys in and trusts in your integrity is going to be the team around you that will lift you up. And yeah, there's a special circle in hell for people who don't have integrity. I think Dante actually had the <laughs> list that had that on the list. Well, what I've learned from those final answers is don't follow instructions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. That was an absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.